It will be nearly two in the morning on Thursday, May 26th, Mr. President, when Air Force One puts down at Helsinki. After an eight and a half hour flight and a seven hour time change, the Finnish capital will be the first leg on your 10 day summit trip. Despite the hour, it will still only be dusk with the sun barely below the horizon. The midnight sun will be occurring from mid-May to late July. Your and Mrs. Reagan's residence in Helsinki will be the Callista Yatorpa guest house. There'll be an official arrival ceremony that Friday afternoon at the presidential palace with your hosts, the president, Dr. Mano Koivisto, and his wife. You'll have a private meeting with the president, during which time Mrs. Reagan will join Mrs. Koivisto for a short tour of the presidential palace. Afterwards, the four of you will have tea. Helsinki is a compact city with its piers, railroad stations, and to a lesser extent, the air terminal, all located in the center of town. So it's only a short distance from the presidential palace to Finlandia Hall, where you're scheduled to make an address later that afternoon to a group that includes the Finnish American Friendship Society. Finnish government officials also will be present. That Saturday, you'll tape the weekly radio address. And at 11.30 Sunday morning, May 29th, depart Helsinki for the one and a half hour flight to Moscow. Because of a one hour time change, it will be 2 p.m. when you land at Vanukova Airport. President and Mrs. Grumiko will head the Soviet welcoming delegation. The welcome will occasion a full military review. Temperatures, incidentally, for this time of year in Moscow, average in the low 60s. Following the airport arrival, your motorcade will pass through the center of Moscow, a city of 8 million people that dominates the political and economic life of the Soviet Union. <laughs> Вся из лунного серебра Песня слышится И не слышится В эти тихие вечера Песня слышится The first stop in Moscow for you and Mrs. Reagan Sunday afternoon will be inside the Kremlin, the ancient citadel that has been the heart of the Soviet system since the Bolsheviks returned the capital to Moscow after seizing power. It is within the Kremlin that you will be welcomed by General Secretary and Mrs. Gorbachev. This is the great St. George's Hall, site of Soviet government and diplomatic receptions. It is located in the Grand Kremlin Palace, where you and the General Secretary will hold some five meetings during your stay. The palace actually is a group of several buildings and exemplifies the Soviets' practical use of and respect for their pre-revolutionary history. The Supreme Soviet holds its sessions here, the council chamber seating some 3,000. Close by in the glass-walled Palace of Congresses, 
The 6,000-seat auditorium is the largest in the Soviet Union and the site of party congresses. Completed in the 1960s, the Palace of Congresses is the most modern building within the Kremlin. And in deference to the history that surrounds it, much of it was built underground. After the welcoming ceremony, Mr. President, you and the General Secretary will adjourn to St. Catherine's Hall in the Kremlin for the first of your meetings. During this time, Mrs. Reagan is scheduled for a walking tour of the Kremlin grounds where 70 acres of government buildings, palaces, churches, and monuments are protected by walls up to 20 feet thick. The ancient citadel is the very heart and soul of the Soviet Union. The Spassky Tower, rising more than 200 feet and the most ornate of the 20 towers, was built to defend the front entrance of the Kremlin. The Carillon in the ornamental clock marks every quarter hour and its chimes are broadcast by radio throughout the Soviet Union's 11 time zones. The Cathedral of the Assumption was built in the 15th century by an Italian architect and was the church to which the Tsars came to be crowned. It is one of the oldest buildings within the Kremlin and continues to be open for religious services. Following your initial meeting with General Secretary Gorbachev, Mr. President, you and Mrs. Reagan will proceed the short distance to Spasso House, Ambassador and Mrs. Matlock's residence, which will be your accommodations while you are in Moscow. A collection of paintings by 20th century American artists has been mounted for the summit and upcoming embassy receptions. No events are scheduled for you that Sunday evening. On Monday, the Memorial Day holiday in the United States, you and Mr. Gorbachev are scheduled for a second meeting in St. Catherine's Hall. This one at mid-morning for approximately an hour and a half. Mrs. Reagan will be visiting a Moscow school, number 1254, which includes students from the first grade through high school. It will be the last day of the school year, and some of the students' parents are likely to be there. The two of you will have a private lunch back at Spasso House, following which you'll take a drive across the Moscow River to visit the Danilov Monastery, which was returned by the government to the church only recently. The 77-year-old spiritual leader of the Russian Orthodox Church, Patriarch Piman, resides there. Today, the monastery's monks restore ancient icons, and time has been allotted for you to see this work and to talk with the monks. The second summit meeting that day is set for mid-afternoon in St. Catherine's Hall. During this time, Mrs. Reagan is scheduled for a walk through Red Square, just outside the Kremlin, which has been the scene of great public events since the 15th century. At one end is St. Basil's Cathedral, a familiar part of the Red Square setting. St. Basil's was built on orders of Ivan the Terrible and is a unique architectural achievement a combination of nine churches. Today, though, the cathedral is a museum. Red Square is longer than four football fields. Every November 7th, the Soviets mark their revolution with a military parade that is reviewed by the nation's leaders atop Lenin's tomb at the wall of the Kremlin. On any day, there are long tourist lines at the Kremlin as sightseers queue up to view the Lenin mausoleum and the snappy, goose-stepping changing of the KGB honor guard. The latter occurs precisely as the Spassky Tower chimes a new hour. A not unfamiliar sight may also be a network news reporter filing a Moscow story using Red Square as the location for the report. Across the square and opposite Lenin's tomb stands the Soviet Union's largest department store, GUM or GUM for short. The state store contains about 150 shops. If time permits during your stay, Mrs. Reagan may tour the Tretyakov Gallery founded by a 19th century Moscow businessman, collector, and art patron. Pavel Mikhailovich Tretyakov, whose portrait is among some 50,000 works of art, envisioned a collection that would display the greatest art of his countrymen. It includes several rooms of icons, works of religious art by painters of the early Russian Orthodox Church. 
Late Monday afternoon, Mr. President, you and Mrs. Reagan will meet at Spassel House with representatives of Soviet dissidents and refuseniks. There will be an official state dinner for you and Mrs. Reagan that evening, hosted by the Gorbachevs. It will be held in the Palace of Facets in the Grand Kremlin Palace. The Palace of Facets gets its name from the faceted limestone blocks which pattern the main front. It was built by Italian architects for Tsar Ivan the Great at the end of the 15th century. It is the only part of the huge Grand Kremlin Palace complex that has been essentially preserved in its original form. On Tuesday, Mrs. Reagan travels to Leningrad for a day of sightseeing. Your day begins with a short morning meeting with General Secretary Gorbachev in his private Kremlin office, following which you and he will walk through the Kremlin grounds to St. Catherine's Hall for another session. Lunchtime will be spent at the House of Writers in the company of a group of writers and artists. Plans are for you to deliver some remarks to the assemblage. Time has been allotted for a White House business prior to the next major event, an address at 4 p.m. to the students and faculty of Moscow State University, whose graduates include the Gorbachevs. The university's facilities are located in a tall, high-rise building in the Lenin Hills, overlooking Moscow. Mrs. Reagan, meanwhile, is due to arrive in Leningrad at about 11.30 a.m., after a one-and-a-half-hour flight from Moscow. She'll be met by the mayor and other officials. The great city of five million was founded by Tsar Peter the Great to open his backward country to the west and to also be his capital. In his honor, for much of its nearly three centuries of existence, it was called St. Petersburg before the Bolsheviks renamed the city Leningrad while returning the capital to Moscow. The first stop will be at a monument to the defenders of Leningrad, where Mrs. Reagan may lay some flowers. The monument commemorates Leningrad's ordeal during World War II, the 900-day siege by Hitler's armies, which finally was broken, but not until nearly 650,000 people had died of starvation. Incidentally, young married couples often leave flowers at the monument for good luck. But to Leningrad, the past also is one of beauty and splendor as seen in the great art collection of the Hermitage. The museum is actually part of a huge complex that includes the Winter Palace, where in 1917, Bolshevik troops ousted the provisional government, thus winning both the capital city and the country. After the Hermitage tour and weather permitting, Mrs. Reagan will travel by hydrofoil to her next stop, Peter the Great's Palace, or Petrodvoretz, it's located about 20 miles from the center of Leningrad. Hydrofoil is considered the best means of getting there, and the trip along the Neva River will take about a half hour. From November until April, the Neva freezes solid and is often used as a main walkway by pedestrians. To Tsar Peter, the palace was to be a Versailles by the sea. The system of ducts and pipes for the waterfalls and fountains has remained essentially the same for over 200 years. Much of this so-called summer palace was looted and destroyed by the retreating German troops after the siege, but is being painstakingly rebuilt. Her visit to Petrodvoretz complete, Mrs. Reagan will proceed through the city to the airport and a late afternoon return flight to Moscow. That evening, you and she will host a reciprocal dinner for the Gorbachevs and guests at Spasso House. Wednesday, June 1st, will be your last full day in Moscow. It will start with the fifth and final meeting with the General Secretary at St. Catherine's Hall. If the situation so dictates, your meeting will be followed by a summit signing of documents in the adjoining St. Vladimir Room. The room's foundations were laid five centuries ago. It has been the site of many signing ceremonies over the years. Mrs. Reagan will be there and also in attendance at a news conference, which you will hold at 4 p.m. that day at Spasso House, 
About 125 reporters are expected for the news conference. You and the Gorbachevs will attend a special performance of the famed Bolshoi Ballet that evening. The Bolshoi was founded in 1776, and although new productions are infrequent, the place is always sold out. The program that night will include various selections by the Bolshoi. Following the special performance, you and Mrs. Reagan will be driven to the General Secretary's dacha outside Moscow, about a half hour's drive. There you'll be the Gorbachev's guests at a private dinner. The ninth day of your summit trip will be the final day in Moscow. Following some brief remarks and a mix and mingle session with embassy personnel and their families at Spasso House, you and Mrs. Reagan travel to St. George's Hall for a farewell with General Secretary and Mrs. Gorbachev. Then it's off to Vanukova Airport and the official departure ceremony. President and Mrs. Gromyko are again expected to head the Soviet delegation. Departure time will be 11 a.m., with Air Force One scheduled to arrive at London's Heathrow Airport early that afternoon. Upon arrival, you and Mrs. Reagan proceed to Winfield House, Ambassador Price's residence, where you'll stay while in London. Late that afternoon, you're scheduled for tea with Queen Elizabeth at Buckingham Palace. And several hours later, you'll go to number 10 Downing Street for a pre-dinner reception with Prime Minister Thatcher. The day's events conclude with dinner with the Prime Minister and Mr. Thatcher. The 10th and final day of your summit trip, Mr. President, will feature a noon address at the Guild Hall, which is located in the old city section of London and has been around for some six centuries. The primary host for the occasion that day is the Corporation of London, headed by the Lord Mayor. Along with officials of the old city will be members of Chatham House, the Royal Institute of International Affairs. Following the Guildhall address, you and Mrs. Reagan are scheduled to meet with U.S. Embassy personnel at Winfield House prior to your departure for home. Shortly before 2 p.m. London time, Air Force One will take off from Heathrow Airport for the seven and a half hour return flight and scheduled late afternoon arrival at Andrews Air Force Base. 